the buses we can start all right uh, welcome everyone and good afternoon uh, welcome to this special talk today we have professor uh, ananta nayanan from uh, the center for high energy physics uh, this is a special lecture organized by the alchemist club and i'll just tell you a little bit about alchemist club before we uh, we go on to the next level uh, so this club is a very unique club in the in the department of inorganic and physical chemistry and it's also a very unique class you know uh, club in the in the institute uh, because this club organizes many activities throughout the year when it's an usual year uh, like this year so we organize various activities such as you know welcoming new phd students uh, welcoming um, uh, new in phd students in our uh, division and department uh, we also organize a lot of uh, memorial lectures a lecture series in the honor of late professor s k rangarajan who was a distinguished faculty in the department as well as an eminent scientist uh, in the country and we also invite not only uh, scientists from all over india we also invite uh, uh, a renowned uh, personalities uh, who are authorities in in economics as well as in different philosophical issues as well as people who are uh, involved in various uh, uh hospitals as well as uh, mental uh, stuff so uh, so with that um, i would like to uh, to give it to professor arunan who will introduce today's special speaker professor uh, b anantha nayanan and I, i'll leave it to the professor arunan okay good afternoon everyone welcome to the talk to be given by professor b anantha nayanan of Center for High Energy Physics. Those, those of you in IAC would know him well. Let me give you a formal introduction. He is a very unusual background. He did his B.Tech in Chemical Engineering from IIT Madras. I happened to be in IIT Madras around the same time doing my M.Sc. in Chemistry. I don't think he met at that time. Though he did B.Tech in Chemical Engineering, he went to University of Delaware in 1985. to do his master of science in physics and continue his phd in physics which he obtained around 1991 the same year as he got the phd as well then he did another unusual thing he came back to pr in ahmedabad in india to do a postdoctoral work for a couple of years and then went to university of lausanne switzerland and university of bern switzerland for two more postdocs he returned to Our center for theoretical studies that's how it was called the chap in 1996 joined here as a faculty he served as a assistant professor associate professor and professor and finally the chairman of the center for theoretical studies and center for higher and physics for almost 10 years i think he has been in the editorial board of european physics journal he was in the editorial board of current science where i have met him He works on low energy physics at high precision, and also beyond the standard model of physics at colliders. Because we have been in constant touch to other media, mm -hmm. he's a fellow of Institute of Mathematical Sciences. He's an associate member of Abdul Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics. He also is a fellow of Komi Baba Council. Um, Right now, I invite Mr. Anantharan to talk about muon G2. I hope all of you have heard about this. So, for us, the introduction. Anant, the stage is yours. Am I on? On me? Am I on? You are on. You can start now. I can hear you. You can share your screen and start. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this very kind invitation to give this talk. Um, so, as you know, there has been a lot of excitement since the seventh of April when there was a, a scientific seminar and a press release from Fermi Lab in the USA on the measurement of uh, a fundamental physical observable, which is the anomalous magnetic moment of a particle known as the muon. and uh, it has been announced that the that there is uh, something of a disagreement between the theory and the experimental measurement of this fundamental quantity 
so uh, the uh, so it's, so in this talk i will try to explain to you what is what has been measured how it has been measured what is the significance of this measurement and also tell you a little bit about what is the theoretical status and what the purported discrepancy is and what might be the source of this discrepancy so as uh, as suggested by the title it's it's a very elementary introduction to the physics of an elementary particle as the name suggests so i will start at the very beginning and i'll try to explain all the terms that go on in this uh, all the all the terms and all the ideas and notions that go into this description over here so is it already shared the screen entire screen it says cancel share share i'm trying to click on the share but it's not happening uh, share anything happening oh, i think we see the screen but the talk is said to be so desktop and window it says desktop and window uh, is it shared now uh, yes, not yet i thought we had checked this earlier so i don't know why it is not <laughs> shared uh, let's see here let me turn on the so, camera maybe is that why we can go through all of this before just share it now i think hmm? I thought we had we had just gone through this and <laughs> it kind of worked properly. Should I should I leave the meeting and come back and hope that? No, no. I think you just stop sharing it and start sharing it again. Do you have oh, a yes. share tray? Share tray. You can keep your yes. video also on, Alan, so that okay audience can see. Is it is it loading now? Do you see anything? Uh, not yet. your entire screen do you see anything now i think we see your screen probably but it is only faces of yeah it's coming oh it's coming you think it's just the internet it's slow is it uh what sir we just checked your top few minutes before this i i I think I think leaving the meeting and coming back would help. Uh, this has happened okay. to me before. Okay. I don't try that. Yeah. Okay. So you're suggesting that I okay share. Now I did a share. Yeah. And, now we can see. Go on. Oh, now now you can see. I think now it's just okay. Twenty twenty. Yeah, you can see your okay. screen. You can okay. make it full okay. screen. Make it full screen like that. I think there's already the full screen. I'm not able to do anything. Sure, you can see. Okay. Okay. So I'll begin to talk. So I'm. I will be telling you about this ingenious measurement of the um, this particular property of this particle that is known as a muon. So a muon was discovered already in the 1940s or so. Uh, it is an elementary particle that is in all respects like an electron, except that it is. 200 times or so heavier than the electron so it has the same electric charge and it has all other interactions exactly like an electron so it belongs to a family of particles that are known as leptons so it is an example of a charged lepton there are also electrically neutral lept uh, leptons which are the neutrinos associated with each of these there is a neutrino of the muon type and then there's a neutrino of the electron type also and there is an even heavier cousin than this which is um, almost 3000 times as heavy as the electron which is known as the tau lepton and is it has its own associated neutrino the tau type neutrino so these six particles belong to a family known as leptons and the tau is very heavy so it decays into many many other kinds of particles it's very short lived both the muon and the tau they decay through what is known as the weak interactions now the muon is the longest of all element longest lived of all elementary particles and it decays into an electron and a neutrino pair one of the electron type and one of the neutrino of the muon type so that's the reason why a muon is actually unstable and it decays in its rest frame with a with a lifetime of about 2.2 uh 2.2 microseconds so it's the longest of all um of all unstable elementary particles now i have already introduced many notions 
uh, including the weak interaction, which is responsible for the decay of the muon, and also the electromagnetic interaction, which is the interaction that we are all familiar with. And together, the electromagnetic and the weak interaction are, are described in a unified framework due to Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg, and that is called the electroweak interactions. There's another family of interactions that is known as strong interactions. And the strong interactions are those in which particles known as quarks participate. There are six kinds of quarks. They are called the up and down quarks, charm and strange quarks, and the top and bottom quarks. So particles that do not participate in the strong interactions are the leptons, okay? And together, all these of the electroweak and the strong interactions, this is what is known as a standard model of elementary particles physics. There is a fourth interaction, which is the gravitational interaction, which is always attractive. The gravitational interaction is different from each of these interactions in, in that it is always attractive, whereas electroweak and strong interactions can sometimes be uh, attractive, they can sometimes be repulsive. That is why at very long uh, distances, the effects of the electroweak and the strong interactions get frozen out and only gravitational interactions survive. That's the reason why you don't have to know the electroweak theory to understand the attraction between the moon and the earth or the sun and the earth, for instance. It's only because of the attractive nature that at very long distances, it's only the gravitational uh, interaction that survives. So the muon, as I said, it carries electric charges, a charge, and it interacts electromagnetically as well. Now, today, we know how to represent these interactions diagrammatically. So for instance, the scattering of two electrons with the exchange of a photon may be represented diagrammatically. It's a very systematic procedure by which we introduce all these uh, interactions. And they go under the name of Feynman diagrams because it was Feynman who found a diagrammatic way of representing these. And also he gave a set of rules by which once you draw a diagram, it makes sense from which you can calculate quantities associated with a particular process, such as scattering amplitudes, or the lifetime of a particle if a particle is unstable, for instance, okay? So the Feynman diagrams are not just a question of drawing diagrams, but there are also rules associated with it, known as the Feynman rules, which tell you how to make mathematical sense out of a diagram once it is drawn. So just as a summary of what I just said, we have three charged leptons, the electron, the muon, and the tau. And each of these has its antiparticles also. An E plus, for instance, would be a positron. You can have a positively charged muon, which is called mu plus, the tau plus. And the neutral leptons are nu E, nu mu, nu mu, and nu tau. And those amongst you who are uh, who will immediately ask me, are there also corresponding uh, anti-neutral anti -neutral leptons? Yes. We represent them with a bar on top, nu e bar, nu mu bar, and nu tau bar. So, uh, Anand, yes. Yes, Mr. King, can you click on the hide at the bottom? You know, there's a stop sharing and hide. Yeah. You oh, click hi. on hide, I think that uh, announcement will disappear. And you can see. Okay. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. That's fine. Yeah. So, as I said, there are six kind of quarks the U, D, uh, the C, S, and the T, B. Now, when we are looking at a quantity like the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, which is the subject of the stop, because of the uh, whole nature of quantum field theory, an observable like this anomalous magnetic moment actually becomes sensitive to all the particles that are present in nature and all the interactions that are present in nature, even though they may not be directly present. So in quantum field theory, through interactions, a particle like the muon would feel the existence of other particles through a systematic expansion in the Feynman diagram language. So you may say that, hey, here we are talking with anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, which seems to be a property that has to do with the electromagnetic interactions. Why are we talking about the entire standard model? Because of the nature of field theory that all the particles, all the interactions do affect the uh, an observable but their um, effect is going to be numerically small, but if you carry out very precise measurements of a quantity like the G minus two of the muon with uh, 
better, then it will be sensitive to the presence of all these particles of all the interactions. So it is to this extent that the measurement of the anomalous magnetic moment becomes a sensitive test of the standard model itself. So here I also have diagrams for you to show how the force carriers of each of these forces, namely the electromagnetic force is represented. So what you see over here, for instance, is the interaction of an electron with a photon. It is written, the wiggly line here is a photon, whereas these two lines on which I forgot to put arrows are the electron. So the force carriers of the electromagnetic interaction are the photon, as we see over here, it's an electromagnetic field. On the other hand, the weak interaction, as I told you, is responsible for the decay of the muon. A muon comes, emits a force carrier known as the W boson, which is a massive particle. It's about uh, 100 times as heavy as a proton. Uh, it, it can be produced virtually. That is, a muon does not emit a real photon, but it emits a virtual W and turns itself into a uh, a uh, neutrino over here, and then this virtual W that is present breaks up into an electron and a, and a neutrino, and that is how the muon decays. An incoming muon turns into a new mu and a new pair with the emission of an electron. And the force carriers of these are represented. Two of them are electrically charged, W plus and W minus, and then there's an electrically neutral partner of these, which is called the Z boson. And these were predicted by Salam, Weinberg, and Glashow, and they were experimentally observed in 1984. So this has, the, their properties are now known to very high precision. So together, the electromagnetic and the weak interactions are called the electroweak interactions. On the other hand, quarks emit gluons like this, and this is how they carry out their interactions. And these are called the strong interactions. And all these put together are known as the standard model. Just like to remind you, the photon itself is massive, is massless. We know this because we know that the electromagnetic force is infinite range, and therefore the force carrier must be massless. And analogously, the gluon is also massless, but it's so strongly interacting that it sits inside hadronic matter, such as photons, neutrons, pions, and so on. But these particles, the W and the Z, they are not massless. As I said, this is about 100 times as heavy as the Z is about 100 times as heavy as the uh, as the as a proton, and the W is somewhat lighter. So how is it that some of these force carriers stay massless while others have become massive? And the answer to this came from Peter Higgs, and this is known as a Higgs phenomenon. That in order to turn force carriers into massive objects, there has to be another sector of the theory, which is known as a Higgs sector. And through the Higgs phenomenon, these become massive. And the price to pay for that is a residual particle known as the Higgs boson, which was experimentally observed in the year 2012, as you know, at LHC. Now, the simplest of all these field theories is what is known as quantum electrodynamics. For the moment, let us get rid of all the species of particles except the electron and the photon. Okay? It is the simplest of all. Uh, in a sense of all field theories. It has only two parameters in it. It has a mass of the electron and it has the electric charge. And this was formulated by, uh, by Dirac, Paul Dirac in 1925 or so. Many other authors, Wolfgang Pauli, Pascal J Jordan, and it was systematized at higher and higher uh, levels in this loop expansion is something that I will introduce to you. Systematized and made mathematically rigorous in a sense by Feynman, Schwinger, and Tomonaga, for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize. And this parameter E, most of the time it will not appear as E, but it will appear with a square and is often divided by this constant 4 pi. And in natural units where h bar and c are put equal to 1, alpha is called the fundamental parameter of quantum electrodynamics. And it is numerically equal to about 1 by 137. It's a rather small number as you can see of the order of 10 to the power of minus 2. Therefore, if you have an expansion for a physical observable, such as the g minus 2, in various powers of alpha, a leading order term, then a, then a term that is proportional to alpha, and then a series where the next term has a coefficient multiplied by alpha squared, alpha cubed, alpha to the 4, and so on. Such a series, actually we know that it's a divergent series, but it's a series in which alpha itself is very small, 
And therefore, we expect that numerically, if you compute to say order alpha, alpha squared, alpha cubed, that the answer that you get in a systematic expansion should converge to a physically sensible answer. So as I said, the interactions are represented by Feynman rules. And this Dirac equation, which is what governs the motion of a free electron, actually makes a prediction for the magnetic moment or the gyromagnetic ratio of an elementary fermion such as the electron. Now here I have, I said I have only two parameters, which is mass of the electron and the electric charge. I could forget about the electron, for instance, and just have a muon. As I said, if you turn off the weak interactions, the theory with muons is identical to the theory with electrons, except that this parameter, which is experimentally fixed, namely the mass of the lepton, uh, is something that is external to the theory. It's a number that is experimentally determined, but for the theory, it doesn't matter. So you may as well have quantum electrodynamics replaced by quantum muon dynamics, and everything else goes through. And then there is a prediction for this from Dirac's theory that the gyromagnetic ratio of this particle is equal to two and not one as one expected because this is a spin half particle, okay? So Feynman rules are like this, that an electron or a positron or muon is represented by a straight line with an arrow because it's a fermion. There's only one other particle in the theory, which is a photon represented by a wavy line. And then there's a vertex like this. And at this vertex, if you have a reduction to a non-relativistic reduction, then it predicts that the gyromagnetic ratio is equal to two, okay? So if you had a very crude experiment, then that would measure the gyromagnetic ratio to be equal to two. And then you would say, oh, everything is consistent. This theory of Dirac uh, uh, for this particle known as the electron or the muon makes a prediction of G equals two. My experiment has measured a number two plus minus point five or something because it's a crude experiment and then you are very satisfied and then you go home. But it's not like that because the Feynman rules also tell you that you can use the same rules that you have over here to draw more complicated diagrams which mathematically will begin to make sense and Feynman rules also require us to have what are called loops. Over here these are all just trees, okay? You either have free lines like this depending on whether it's an external line or an internal line and you have a vertex like this. Or, and these are called tree diagrams. In contrast to what we call loop diagrams, that is, if you cut this diagram over here of the vacuum polarization, all you have is one vertex here and have another vertex here, but you're allowed to join these vertices, which means that this, loosely speaking, is an electron-positron pair that jumps out of the vacuum, that hooks on to the photon on the left and then goes to a photon on the right. Now, Feynman also tells you mathematically how to evaluate a diagram like this. It is not just a matter of drawing, drawing diagrams, but associated with such loops, there is a specific calcul calculation and procedure that you'll have to follow and evaluate this object. Now, Dyson is a person who went in deep into this theory of how to draw these diagrams, how to evaluate these things numerically, how to do... Uh, so if you try to evaluate a diagram like this, you would find that it's actually mathematically divergent. But there is a program that is known as renormalization that requires you to what is known as regularize these divergent quantities and extract the infinite parts of these and then to make sense out of this calculation. So just like you have this vacuum polarization, which as the name suggests is something that actually screens the electric charge, then there's something known as a self-energy that the electron that comes over here emits a photon and reabsorbs it which kind of changes the mass of the electron in some well-defined way. And then we renormalize that effect and account for the self-energy of the electron. Such an effect also exists in classical field theory. Uh, it is known as a classical charge radius of the, uh, of the electron. It is, it is known one, uh, in, in classical electrodynamics also. A third example is what is known as a vertex correction. That is the original vertex that I drew over here can have this correction where a photon is emitted from the line on top and is emitted by the line on the bottom, okay? Now this is, a, is, a, is an amazing diagram because this immediately leads for you and this can be evaluated and then uh, they used properly. And then you can ask what is the contribution of this diagram to the gyromagnetic ratio? And this is what was done by Schwinger in his Nobel Prize winning work. And he evaluated this quantity 
and it gave a beautiful one loop finite answer and is evaluated to alpha divided by 2 pi where alpha is something that we had already mentioned it is numerically equal to about 1 by 137 and this is so important that it's actually etched on his gravestone this particular uh, expression alpha by 2 pi nothing could be simpler than this and this already is an example of the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon so we express it in this way because g is equal to 2 in the classical case so this is a departure from the prediction of the dirac theory that g should be equal to 2 so g minus 2 is the departure and it is divided by 2 for various conventional reasons and this evaluates to a number now if you remember recall alpha is 1 by 137 divided by 2 pi which is roughly 6 point something so you get roughly 1 by 800 as a number of alpha divided by 2 pi which is 0 0.00116 okay so this seems like a small number but early on it was realized that if there is really such a departure it could actually be seen in experiments so already by the 50s and 60s in CERN they had started to devise experiments to try to find the departure from the classical prediction of g equal to 2 to a number that is roughly equal to 1 by 800. So what has been done now is to evaluate this quantity that was alpha by 2 pi in the simplest theory of QED with only one photoproton and only one species of particles is now extended to the full standard model with higher and higher loops in electrodynamics, with several loops in the weak interactions, with all kinds of con uh, contributions from all the particles in the spectrum, no, namely the U quarks, the D quarks, all these things, how do they contribute to this particular correction of this vertex, okay? Now, this is the main aim of this, of the theory that is behind the G minus two of the muon, okay? Now, I want to stop here for a minute and see if there are any questions on the motivation of what it is that we are doing in this particular uh, study. How, the question is, how do we now do the measurement and how do we do the theoretical calculations to see whether all this makes any sense or not? So, uh, so if there are any questions for the moment on what I'm saying, I would be happy to look at it or I can proceed and maybe take questions at the end. Any, any views on the matter? Arunan, any views? Questions from anybody? You can raise your hand or ask. Okay, if there are no questions, then, then let me proceed. Yeah. Okay, now actually, when Arunan asked me to give this talk, I, I knew roughly the, the importance of this experiment. And long ago, in one of the courses that I was teaching, I had assigned it as a project to one of the students to figure out how the experiment was going to be done. And this was already five or six years ago when the experiment had been dismantled in Brookhaven in Long Island in the US and the magnet was being sent around to Fermi Lab, which is in, uh, which is in the state of, uh, of Illinois. So this thing had to travel several thousand miles, this huge magnet from Brookhaven, and I asked the students to, to look at this. But I had forgotten, so it took me a couple of days of deep preparation to figure out how this was going. So as I was trying to say, what happens is that we want now this particular diagram evaluated to higher and higher orders and loops in the entire standard model. And the reason why this thing becomes sensitive to all the particles in the, in the, in the spectrum of the standard model and also to all interactions beyond the standard model, if there are any, if there are particles not described by the standard model or if there are new interactions, all of them would feed into these loop corrections, not the one loop, but higher and higher loop corrections. It is a reflection actually of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which tells you at very small time scales, you can have essentially, I mean, I'm speaking heuristically, you can have a violation of energy conservation. That is delta E can be very large if delta T is very small. So on very small time scales, you can have particles and antiparticles popping out of the vacuum that may be much heavier than the scale at which you're doing the experiment. As I said, the muon itself decays through the emission of a virtual particle, right? The muon is about 105 MeV, 
whereas the W is 80 GeV. There are three orders of magnitude over there. Still, a virtual photon, a virtual W can pop out of the vacuum and then produce an electron uh, and neutrino pair, and then the neuron has decayed. So, in the knowledge at the three level, you can view these quantum mechanical processes as one associated with the fact that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle allows you to have violation of energy at you know, on a small time scale as dictated by the uncertainty principle. So you can think of loops also as resulting from fluctuations of particle or particle pairs from the vacuum. And as I said, we can replace the electron by the neuron, and this is how this experiment is done. And this particular expansion that I mentioned and talked to you about is associated with the loop expansion, but as the loop expansion goes on, it gets suppressed by various powers of this alpha. And that's the reason why you get a series in alpha. But as position increases, higher and higher loops need to be accounted for because of the position of the measurement. And theory has to be also a comparable position. So these are the kinds of points that I've made that you have to have a series for this G minus two, not just in electromagnetism, but also in the full electroweak theory. There are electroweak corrections, there are electrodynamics corrections, there are also corrections due to the production of hadronic matter in the vacuum present in some of the loops. Okay, So it is a high precision measurement versus high precision calculations that are required. And if the precision uh, high precise calculations that we have done do not account for the high precision measurement, then it could very well signal that we have physics beyond the so-called standard model. It could be the presence of additional particles, could be the presence of additional interactions, or some of the couplings that we assume are not quite correct. Maybe there are contributions coming from more exotic theories, such as supersymmetry or extra dimensions, and so on and so forth. But now I will tell you a little bit about the fascinating experiments that allow you to actually do a measurement of the G minus two of the neuron. You see, unlike in chemistry where you have stable particles and you can, you know, have particles, you know, sitting inside, say, a spectrometer, you have a collimated beam that you control and you don't have, of course, you also have unstable states, you can have excited states, you may have to carry out precision measurements before that state uh, decays into the ground state or something like this. Yeah, you're fundamentally dealing with an unstable particle, a particle with a finite lifetime. But it also provides you an advantage, the muon, because we know very precisely how it is going to decay. So if you are able to study the decay products very accurately from the measurements of the, of the spectrum of the energy of the decay electron or the decay positron, depending on whether you're working with the mu minus or, or the mu plus, from the decay products itself, you may be able to say something about the G minus two of the neuron. Now, what is meant by the electro, the anomalous magnetic moment or the, or the magnetic moment? It means that it is like a spinning particle, which is like a bar magnet, because the spin is associated with the magnetic moment. And if you put it in a constant magnetic field, then the particle will precess. And the precession frequency is directly related to the gyromagnetic ratio. So what you need are a collimated beam of neurons where which are polarized, whose spin direction you know very well, because the spin direction also determines the, um, the, the magnetization of this of the neurons. And you need a constant magnetic field in which you immerse this collection of neurons. And watch it persist. That is really how you're going to do it. But how do you watch it persist? If you can't shine a beam of light on the muon, then expect it to do something because uh, it's just not possible. But a muon that is that is spinning and is processing in a magnetic field then decays. And then if you look at the decay product, maybe that is going to tell you about how the muon was polarized at that given instant. So that is the principle of this experiment. And we are actually fortunate because the muon decay is weakly and the weak interaction is an example of what is known as a parity violating decay. So a muon that is polarized preferentially emits high energy electrons in the direction of its magnetization 
or in the direction of its spin vector. Okay, so that's the whole point of this. So you have a spin vector, and the spin vector is processing in a magnetic field, and as it processes, it emits electrons. And if you look at the most energetic electrons, obviously the most ele uh, um, uh, energetic electron will be in the same direction as the polarization. But of course, what you're going to get is you're going to get a spray of electrons from this collimated beam of muons, which is going to come at you in a forward cone whose axis is the polarization vector. So if you look at the spray of electrons that is coming out at you, and then you look at this forward cone, and you're able to accurately find the characteristics of this forward cone. From this, you can construct where the polarization of the muon was, okay? So this is, these are all the ingredients that go into the measurement of the G of the muon, okay? Now, I really want to know, stop here and see if there is any question about this. So a muon is a spin half particle. You have, I'll tell you how you will get a polarized beam of muons which move around in a cyclotron in a circle with highly controlled uh, uh, orbits. Then it is immersed in a magnetic field. Then this magnetization vector processes in a constant B field. And then it emits, then it decays and emits the most energetic electrons in a forward cone. Then you have detectors that see this forward cone, and from there you reconstruct the polarization and get a measurement of the G minus two of the muon. Is this clear? Yeah, go on. Okay, fine. So the principle of the experiment at the Fermi lab, which is called the muon G minus two experiment, actually is the same principle as what was used in Brookhaven, uh, which, which also ran for four or five years. And it was also the principle of the CERN experiments which had the first measurements of the G minus two. And these are the principles. The aim of the Fermilab experiment is to reduce the errors by a factor of four. That is the most important improvement of the Fermilab experiment over the Brookhaven experiment. <clears throat> so what we have here are storage rings in which the muons circulate at something known as the magic energy. And I'll also calculate this magic energy for you. Okay, so the muons are in the XY plane and they are circulating in an annular region known as a storage ring. And then they circulate with a, pre with a period of 149 nanoseconds. Okay, that's the period in which the muons circulate. And they are traveling at 99.94% of the speed of light. So at that speed, the lifetime which I had mentioned to be 2.2 uh, microseconds actually increases due to the Lorentz effect to about 64 microseconds, okay? So you have muons which live for about 64 microseconds going around in um, in a ring, in the storage ring with a period of 149 nanoseconds. So you see there are two scales already in the problem. One is 64 microseconds and the other is 149 nanoseconds, which means that this beam of muons goes around several hundred times and therefore, it is essentially a long-lived particle. And as it moves along, it begins to decay radioactively because, you know, it has an exponential decay law. And the muons, as they move along, uh, they are kept in a circular orbit by both the B field and the compensating electric field, which keeps it in the XY plane and keeps the velocity constant. But when the muon decays, it decays an electron whose energy is less than that of the muon, and therefore the decay electron is no longer going to be in the same orbit, but will leave the storage ring and it will move inside because its energy is lower than that of the muon. Because the muon decays into three particles, the electron and the two neutrinos, the neutrinos carry away part of the energy, and the produced electron now will no longer stay in the orbit and will actually come into the volume of the ring and there you have the detectors, 24 of them placed around so that the electron that is produced from the decay actually hits one of these 24 detectors that are present. And that is how the experiment is done. So you know the roughly when the muon decayed and you know the energy that is deposited 
near calorimeter. So that is the principle of this amazing experiment. So you have a uniform magnetic field in which the muon polarization successes. The decay of the muon, which is because of parity violation, is seen by the infalling positrons and correlated with the polarization vector, and it is seen by an array of 24 Cherenkov detectors. So what is available are the energy and the timing information of this particular electron. And then they are able to plot very accurately what is the time, the number of, uh, of electrons that are seen by the detector, sufficiently energetic um, electrons that are produced in the decay. And then uh, they, are, uh, they are plotted in what is known as a little box. But there are a few more effects that I need to explain in the coming phase. So here I have some information about, compared to the Brookhaven experiment, how the present Fermilab experiment is better, the various improvements, the stability of the magnetic field, the purity of the magnetic field, and so on. These are the improvements in the experiment. So to recall once again, so a muon over here decays into a new mu and an electron in the new bar, and it decays into uh, these through a parity violating interaction which has the structure of V minus A that is a vector minus axial vector and the spin half particle has a mass of about 105 MeV. So how are these muons produced? You may be asking how do we produce the muons? Well, very energetic protons are smashed into a fixed target and produce a large number of particles known as pions which are basically uh, U and V quark pairs, U D bar pairs and this decays primarily into a two-body decay with a muon like this. And this mu here is actually polarized in this particular production itself. So this is what the experiment roughly looks like. So this is the storage ring with a, with a diameter of roughly 50 feet over here. So the muons that are produced in the pion decay are injected over here and then they circulate in the ring like this. And they are also polarized. Okay? So what we have is a uniform V field at the storage ring, which is coming out of the page, out of the plane of this page over here. So what you have over here is this plane that I have drawn over here. The V field is here. The muon that has entered is polarized in this uh, direction like this. And then it begins to process around the V field like this. So whenever a particle has a gyromagnetic ratio, that is what is meant when it is immersed in a V field, it will process like this over there. Now, at the time of injection of the muon, as you can see over here, the momentum of the muon and the polarization are collinear at the time of the entry into this field, okay, into the storage ring in the left part. Do you people see my uh, cursor over here? Can you people see my cursor? Yeah, now it's... Yeah, yeah. over yes. here. So you see, at the time of the injection, the momentum vector and the polarization vector are collinear. But because of the presence of the anomalous magnetic moment, a little after these two enter into the ring, the momentum, of course, is always tangential to the circle over here. Whereas this polarization vector begins to process and develops a non-zero angle between the two. At a later time, the angle between the momentum and the, and the polarization vector increases. So this polarization vector goes round and round and round this momentum vector, okay? And the decay products are strongly correlated to the direction of the polarization vector. So if the muon decays at this point over here, the forward energetic cone, <coughs> the axis of the forward energetic cone will be the polarization vector and the decay products that will get deposited in the detector over here will know about the polarization vector over here, okay? So that is the principle. You have 24 detectors like this. You have these muons entering the ring and these particles are deposited and the energy and the timing information is recorded by the experiment from which they actually do the measurement of the G minus two of the muon. So thus, parity violation is key to this. A few more ingenious things that I want to tell you about this experiment. Okay, so this 
omega a is the precession frequency of the polarization vector with respect to the momentum vector over here. That's the omega a with which this thing is going around. So there are several frequencies in the problem. One is the period associated with the motion around the, around the storage ring, which I told you is 149 seconds, uh, my, uh, nanoseconds for the muons to go around. Then there is this frequency associated with the precession of this polarization vector along uh, with respect to the D field over here. Okay. So the D field is coming out of the stage in this diagram. So this precession frequency in the absence of any electric field would be just the anomalous magnetic moment times the magnetic field divided by various fundamental constants. But if you had just a B field, then these muons would not stay in the XY plane. They will begin to, to also start to spiral around the magnetic field. So you have to compensate for their upward motion, which would be a result of the Lorentz force due to the motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field, right? So you would have to make sure that these muons stay inside the storage ring. So in order to do that, they have um, electric fields to compensate for that, which is the second term over here. But you see, the B field is known to very high purity, but the electric field is not known to very high purity. So if the second term were present, then it would ruin the measurement at the level of precision you desire because it's not possible to know the electric field at that level of precision. So the only way to do that is to find some way in which you cancel out the free factor of the second term, the beta cross E term that is present in this expression. And this is the amazing thing that you can actually do that with a rough value of alpha by two pi that is given over here. You can choose gamma in such a way where gamma is the velocity of the, of the muon, gamma in a, given in units of, um, given in units of uh, the speed of light, and you can try to cancel out this factor. So that is why the energy of the muons is chosen in such a way to cancel the second term. This is an amazing thing that such an energy is actually possible. And if you work it out, you will find that the, the magic energy for the muons has to be 3.1 GeV, which means that the muons are traveling at 99.94% of the speed of light. And if you solve for gamma, it turns out to be a number of 29.36. And if you multiply that with the lifetime of the muon, the rest frame that is given over here, you get a lifetime of 64 microseconds. So you see, there are all these wonderful things that go into the design of this experiment. Then a third term is also present, which is known as the pitch term over here. But this involves only the B field, which is known to high precision. Therefore, it will not ruin the precision measurement of the experiment. So you see a lot of work in this Brookhaven experiment has, is, has to do with the control of the B field and evaluation of this pitch correction and all these things. Okay, So that is where we are coming from. So as the polarization processes, and the energy spectrum also changes. We also have to account for the Lorentz boost. Now, if you have the muon coming, and then the, are you able to see me? So you have the muon coming, you have the polarization vector, and then this muon decays, then the electron which is present, which is produced in the same direction as the polarization vector gets boosted by the motion of the parent muon, in which case it gets an additional energy because of the motion of the muon. If on the other hand, the polarization vector which has persisted and come all the way back, and now the electron that is produced in the rest frame of the muon is produced in this direction, it is in the direction opposite to the motion of the muon, therefore the energy gets degraded when the polarization vector is pointing opposite to the momentum. So as the beam goes along, this vector is processing, and therefore you also get a modulation of the energy of the decay products. Okay, So these are all the principles of the measurement of this uh, principles of measurement of the energy. And what you do over here ultimately is you count the number of electrons or positrons above a certain threshold that is the most energetic electrons and plot it as a function of time. And here it is shown uh, wrapped around modulo 100 
microsecond, you see a rise and fall of the number of events that are seen by your detectors. And this becomes a probe of the precession frequency of the, of the polarization vector in this particular instance. So this is the principle of this experiment. Okay. So these are the various things that go into the analysis of this experiment and how they pull out the value of the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. Now, what I can do is I can share for you some of the things that I have got from the internet and explain to you a little bit what they show over here. Okay. Is that all right for me to do that? Uh, go on. Know. Yeah. Uh, go okay. on. Okay, fine. Okay, so this is the um, the publication in Physical Review Letters, which is also reported on the April 7th, where they talk about the measurement of the positive muon anomalous moment to 0.46 uh, parts per million. So that is the measurement that they are talking about. Okay. okay. So these are the various diagrams in the theory part that one needs to evaluate. This is the Schwinger correction, and there would be a a corresponding uh, correction because of LFA corrections over here. This is because of large numbers of uh, uh, hadronic particles like pions moving around in these loops. Then there's also something known as light by light scattering, which actually is named after the famous biologist Delbruck. This is an example of an application of Delbruck scattering. Now, Delbruck, who won the Nobel Prize in biology, he had his uh, beginnings in elementary particle physics. And he contributed uh, this particular study, you know, which is on in, uh, named in his honor as Delbruck scattering. So this diagram is the Delbruck. Okay. So here is the experimental method that is described over here in this paper. This is all the pieces that I described. Here is the pitch correction, and here is the choice of the magic energy so that the electric field uh, is is not accounted for. Okay. And then what they have over here is this anomalous precession, precession frequency uh, over here. Let me just go bigger. So what they over have over here is time after injection modulo 102.5 microseconds. That is what is shown over here. And here is the number of particles that are seen by the detector. So you can see that there is a modulation of the energy over here where the period is proportional to the uh, precession frequency over here. Uh, you can see that there is an overall exponential fall in the number of events that are received as expected. See, there's a log plot over here. <coughs> On the y-axis, you have 10 to the power of 2, 10 to the power of 3, 4, 5, 6. So this fall over here in this, you can see, is governed by the exponential law for radioactive decay. And what ends over here again starts over here, and you can see the next 102.5 seconds. So, by counting these particles, the detector in the detector associated with the forward cone of the most energetic particles, and by accurately knowing when these muons decayed and the energy spectrum associated with the Lorentz uh, factor that I described of either producing the electrons in the direction of the motion or opposite to the direction of motion, depending on whether the polarization vector was pointing in the same direction as the momentum or opposite to the direction of the motion. They are able to reconstruct this plot. And from this plot, they obtain the measurement of the uh, anomalous magnetic moment, which is the number that I give over here. So this is given in units of 10 to the power of minus 10. This was from the old Brookhaven publication. We have a new publication, which is consistent with the old publication. So this is consistent with the new publication. So this is various excerpts of the TRL publication. So what is the theory situation now? So on April 7, there were two talks. The theory talk was given by Aida al Khadra. She's a professor at, um, at the University of Illinois. And then there was an experimental report that was given by Chris Polly. And in her talk, she reviewed the various contributions. 
So this is the so-called PVD contribution over here. Plus dot 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 here stands for higher order, higher loop connections, which are known to very high order. And these have been calculated almost to 0 0.001 parts per million accuracy. Then there are weak corrections, which are also calculated. But I'd like you to see the scale. Here you see it is starting at 116584718, whereas here it is 153.6. Okay. So the bulk of the contribution comes from the pure QED sector, whereas there are also contributions coming from the weak interactions, which are numerically small, but rather fairly accurately known. What is accurate, not accurately known are these hadronic contributions where you have these various quarks running around in the loops, and these have to be evaluated in theory using many different kinds of techniques, and that is where I have been participating in calculating these hadronic vacuum polarization calculations using what we call dispersion relations. These have also been evaluated on the computer in what is known as lattice gauge theories, and that there is some excitement about the calculations in these uh, in the lattice gauge theory sector also. So this is the Delbruck scattering as applied to this hadronic light by light scattering. These are also numerically small. Therefore, the most um, tricky part of the calculations actually come from this hadronic, and that is where bulk of the uh, <coughs> theoretical uncertainty resides, and that is where <coughs> a lot of theoretical work has been directed at these hadronic calculations. So, long, so along with many of our students, um, the former students, present students, we have participated in calculating these things, and our work has been cited in the in the uh, theory so-called white paper. So let me see what are the numbers quoted by El Khadra in her talk. So if you add up all these things, you will get a number that looks like this. And I want you to concentrate on these last four digits. 1810 with uncertainty of 43. Okay, 43 pertains to the last two digits. But you see this is 1810. On the other hand, the experimental combination gives a number 2061 with an uncertainty of 41. You see? So this is 1800 with an uncertainty of 43, whereas this is almost 2100. And within the errors, they do not agree. So this is where the excitement is. Why is it that there is a discrepancy between these numbers essentially at what they call 4.2 sigma. So this 4 sigma deviation is what people are worried about. Why is it like this? So let me show you one or two more recent talks of how this thing looks. So here is a talk uh, given by Chris Lenner recently, and he shows the discrepancy over here. Before the new experimental result, the difference between the standard model and the experimental expressed in 10 to the power of minus 10. So this WP20 is the white paper 20, and this was the Brookhaven, and this was the discrepancy between the uh, Brookhaven, which is this full orange band over here, centered over, centered over here, and this. The new experimental result, the central value does not agree with the central value of Brookhaven. It is closer, it's more to the left, so it comes more into agreement with the standard model. And if you just look at the Fermi lab measurement, the discrepancy actually is only 3.3 sigma. It, why exactly it is like this, we don't know. And only as we move along, time will tell as to why there is this difference and discrepancy between theory and experiment. So in this talk, I just wanted to highlight for you, this was not meant to be a very serious theory seminar going into all the assumptions of this hadronic evaluations. This is only meant to tell you about the beauty of this experiment, the principles of this experiment, the nature of the sensitivity, and how they achieve the sensitivity, and how hundreds of theorists also participate in calculating these things with the standard model. So that was my aim in this so-called pedestrian talk, and I hope that I have achieved some, uh, you know, some of my goal in talking to you today.
So let me stop here and let us try to make this more participative and have an interaction. Okay. So I'll stop sharing the screen now. Thanks, Anil. Thank Are there any questions from anyone? You can raise your hand or unmute and ask. How do I stop scare, sharing the screen? You have already uh, stopped. There is a, you can. You are still sharing the screen. Uh, how do I stop sharing the screen? On the right, basically, you this in a power and then share content and. Oh, okay. Stop, stop sharing. sharing. Okay, okay. Stop okay. sharing. Yeah, okay. Good. Okay, Bini, you can start. Um, Anand, hi. Um, hi, that was hi. A very, very interesting yeah. talk. Um, yeah, the question you. I have is this. Um, if the discrepancy between experiment and theory is actually real, yeah. uh, what new particle uh, would account for the difference? You know, there are already many, many papers where uh, they are studying all these things. Uh, I haven't yet looked at them because to me, the question is, how can it show up here and not show up anywhere else? There are so many other systems which are also studied at high precision. Recently, there was another measurement at LHC uh, involving B quarks, quark, uh, uh, mesons uh, containing the B quark, where also there are some discrepancies between the standard model prediction and, uh, and uh, the LHC measurement. It would really be amazing how any non-standard model particles could be hiding everywhere else and not, and only show up over here. Uh, I, I have no, no uh, feeling for it yet. There could be some particle that just couples to the muon. It is very dependent on the flavor of the particle. Just couples and gives a small push uh, to the G minus 2 and doesn't do anything else. So I don't know exactly how that would be the case. Okay, thanks. Tanay Patek, you can unmute and ask. Yeah, uh, so uh, it says uh, the recent discrepancy, uh, the recent discrepancy is uh, around 4.2 sigma. Can you just give an idea of uh, how big that discrepancy is? Okay, let's see. Uh, let me share the screen again and show you one of the figures. That's the best way to do it. Uh, okay, let's see over here. Do you see this? Uh, have I shared the screen successfully? It should be coming now. I don't see it. I don't see it yet. Uh, PowerPoint screen share. Okay, fine. I think it's just uh, loading very slowly. It's, it's coming. Yeah. Entire screen. Is it I mean, can put your screen on and also your video on. So if needed, you can go back. Oh, you don't okay. see it yet. Yeah. Because I do remember the slide where you showed the difference. I think, can I? Yeah, I don't know why it is not sharing the screen. Um, oh. it, it's not loading. Okay, uh, so I, I think have I also had a power power cut over here. Probably that's why. I think there's also uh, you know the power came and went. Probably another reason why it's not. Uh, oh, okay. not loading. Yeah, yeah, I can show it to you later. Where where the yes. Okay. Oh, I also have one more follow up question. Uh, is it possible that uh, the discrepancy is due to some of the statistical fluctuations? Well, you see, this is. All based on finite statistics only, right? So yeah. even when you when you say that it's a 4.2 sigma, it means that this is just a, just that there is a chance one in thousand or one in two thousand that it was a deviation from the standard model. Okay. Now what they have done is this is based on what they call run one of their data. They have also taken the data for run two and run three, and they say that it will take them a year to analyze this data. So as their own statistics improves, and as their probably understanding of systematics moves, uh, the, their central value may migrate towards the standard model. You see, already their central value was closer to the theory central value than the BNL central value. Okay, so we don't know. 
we must have an open mind to see how as the statistics improves uh, whether it goes in our in our favor or in the standard model favor or not even in the standard model the evaluations they depend on the kind of uh, pion scattering data that is a pion production data that is adopted there are some experiments due to babar collaboration where systematically the cross sections are a bit higher compared to another experiment from tuskati now the experts say that all these experiments are equally good so we have to have a global average over all those experiments we don't know you know maybe there is some systematics over there Um, so you know the experts will keep discussing and then they will come with a come up with a number in the coming months but it's not clear how the standard model can actually uh, standard model number can actually be substantially bigger than what it is okay okay thank you uh, sudhir raniwala i saw your hand sir would you like to ask something sudhir yeah 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 uh, i mean my question was already answered what are the possible explanations for the discrepancy so okay, as anand yes. says there are none right now and it's surprising that the standard model is uh, showing up an effect or beyond the standard model physics if at all is showing up an effect only in this experiment and not otherwise so my question is essentially answered thank you actually one of the things that uh, that uh, particle physicists should think about is you know the measurement uh, decay depends very crucially on the assumption that the muon decay is maximally parity violating so maybe there there may be some room for some other right handed current in the muon decay but that's also constrained from many other sources supposing it was not 100% parity violating say 99% presence of something else how much would it change probably the experts have thought about all these things um, of course that would also be non standard model in a sense so that would that could be one reason yeah how about finite neutrino mass yes all these things may be playing some role you know just making that small difference as we as we can see these differences are now at this at this 11th decimal place so you know we don't know not quite 11th because we saw okay like the 8th decimal place maybe these things do make a difference over there um but it's an actually ingenious experiment and it's not that huge you know it is all in one hole the diameter of this magnet uh, the, the, the circum is 50 feet it's not an lhc type experiment on which uh, sudhir works which is 27 km circum circumference here we are talking about feet and not kilometers you know or tens of kilometers so it's a modest experiment uh, another experiment is being uh, proposed in japan which does not depend on this kind of magic energy and so on it's a much smaller scale experiment but they say that they may have comparable precision if it is funded that would be very interesting to know whether they will get an independent measurement see to me this is only one experiment and it's the same magnet it would be very nice to reproduce this in some other laboratory setting and see what kind of result we get Anand, I have some questions, maybe not directly related to your talk, but related to muon and fundamental particles. You know, in chemistry, I keep reading papers, seeing papers, not reading muonium hydride. Yes. Really studied by chemists. So those yes. muons are the anti-muons or the muon of the positive charge. Because the way the title written is muonium hydride. Yes. Yes. So, so uh, of course, there, you know, want, the, there the, must the, be an antiparticle. Yeah. So uh, I don't know exactly what you have in mind, but you see the muon, even though it's unstable, uh, it has a lifetime of of microseconds. So it is possible mm -hmm. to capture a muon, let us say, on a proton, and uh, look at it do several uh, Bohr orbits, and uh, actually that is used in the measurement of the proton uh, radius also. you see mm -hmm. uh, so you can form essentially an atom of a, of, a, of of hydrogen where the electron is replaced by a muon and muon. then sufficiently long lived so that you can even study the spectrum the hydrogen x spectrum with a heavy particle in in the place of the electron and see what is going on i think some places do these experiments also so it's it's pretty pretty they, the reason i thought about this is they call it muonium hydride 
Yes. It's almost like the antiproton and antimuon. Yes. The way the name is given. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I was wondering if we have a plus muon and my, the regular minus muon, would the G be equal for the two or would we expect them to be different? Oh, you mean for the mu plus and mu minus? Uh, yeah. You see, this experiment that is done by uh, Fermi Lab, actually most of it is using positive muons and uh, they look at the positive positron spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. I, as per the... Um, uh, you know, constraints of the special theory of relativity, you expect them to be identical, whether it is. Um, now, I don't know at what level of precision you would have to go before you see a difference in the anomalous magnetic moment of a mu plus compared with that of mu minus. That must be several orders of magnitude away before we can even start to see that kind of a difference. Just like, you know, you know the measurements of masses of electron and mass of positron, uh, they agreed to, I don't know, how many, 10, 15, 20 uh, decimal places. And the equality of the masses of particle and antiparticle, they are supposed to be identically equal uh, in the special theory of relativity. If there's any real difference, it would mean that there is a violation of, uh, of the principles of the special theory of relativity. Okay, I think the main reason I asked you was this. I saw you mentioning about muon decaying into positron. Yes. So that maybe they are measuring it on the positive muon rather than the one you started with. So they are expected to be equal. That's yes, yes, yes. It all depends on the experiment and depends on the source for whether you get preferentially you're able to produce large numbers of mu plus or large numbers of mu minus depending on the X on the production source. So actually I have not checked whether Brookhaven did it with mu plus or mu minus. So it has to do with just an experimental choice. That's all. Yeah. Jemis? Yeah, I have a, uh, a very uh, shall I say foolish question, you know, but uh, uh, I was reminded of a, a talk given by Sendil some years ago. You know, we had a faculty member in physics in Sendil. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, he was talking about uh, the possibility of, uh, uh, of uh, separating the mass and the charge of electron. Uh, into two parts. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, it may be easier to do that with muon uh, than with electron, right? It's possible. You see, I think it, this is all a playground of ideas. One has to make a proposal and see whether experimentally how it is possible to do it. As I said, as there are more and more muon uh, facilities available, one would like to do more and more interesting experiments, even if they are simple, whether it can shed some light on some unusual questions. Uh, this I don't know, but I suppose uh, it's not impossible to do it. Uh, the electron question was not uh, answered, right? Uh, it's in this idea that electron uh, mass and spin can be separated. That I have not way. followed. I have not followed that okay. idea. Okay. Thank you. There any other questions from anyone? If not, uh, let's uh, join hands and thank. Mr. Anand Narayan for an illuminating talk. Thanks, Anand. Thank you. I hope, I hope I was able to get some points across. You know, it's a fairly complicated thing. So I was trying to make it as uh, accessible as possible. Uh, I hope it was. Before I sign out, I had one last question. Yes, Is it sir. just going? Forty-one and forty-three. Is it just a coincidence? The uncertainty in theory and experiment are almost identical. No, 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 no. That's just an accident. There's a decimal just system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you all for joining. I hope you've learned something about the muons and muon. Thank you all. You can Thank sign you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.